in the late 1970s when he was running tax and review competitions. And I'd just like to mention to you guys that some of the things that Joe Kish influenced me in. Um, Joe Kish, in the early 80s, I attended tax and review competitions and met Mr. Kish. And I took a second place and he personally critiqued it. And I've you know, honored that all these years. I also attended a mass sculpturing class that Joe, I think it was probably the first to have a mass sculpturing contest or a class. We all did coyote heads. And, and did anybody ever do that? Am I the only one? Just a, oh, there's a few of us in the crowd. So, and not only that, how many of us in this audience did the 35 millimeter mail in, get your picture critiqued and win a few points by Joe Kish? I did. I mailed every, I mailed all that in. Joe influenced me in photography. Joe influenced me in those ways. And once, the greatest thing that ever happened to me uh, regarding Joe Kish was that uh, when Joe was with Precision Mannequins, he was coming to Alaska to collect a, an animal. And I was called up to order a form and he offered to lug it to Alaska. So I said, well, if you'll bring that form to Alaska, I'll let you spend the night in my house. Now, he doesn't even remember this probably, but he spent the night at my house. Joe Kish, my taxidermy hero. And so those are just some of the things that Joe did for me, and he didn't even know he did it. So I just want to say thanks, Joe, for all you've done for the industry and for all the guys like me that were an 18-year-old 30 years ago. Thank you, Joe. Russell. I think and you're proper in referring to Joe as Mr. Joe Kish. Mm -hmm. I'm older than you. I'm going to call him Uncle Joe. <laughs> but Joe was so instrumental in my career, he doesn't realize what he did. And many others in here. I can talk to all my friends, Harry Paulson, Bob Berry, many of you that came up during that period of time. And when Joe took over Wide World of Taxidermy, renamed it Taxidermy Review, a renaissance occurred in this industry. Sculpturing, improvement in the quality of what we did, quality taxidermy and standards in commercial taxidermy, and a motivation to sculpture better forms and build the taxidermy supply industry today. He did all this and more. And when we instituted the Lifetime Achievement Award here, it takes special people that have done special things, and Joe's one of them. My good friend Ken Edwards put together a video with the help of Joe and many of his friends. Here's the story of Joe Kish. Pennsylvania on May 8, 1942, exactly 73 years ago today. He grew up in a hundred-year-old log cabin on a farm east of town where his lifelong interest in natural history took hold. On a sixth grade field trip to the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, he was spellbound by the mounted animals in their habitat dioramas. So impressed by the displays, the 11-year-old Joe Kish told a classmate that he would like to work at the museum someday. As a teenager, Joe was inducted into the Order of the Arrow, the National Honor Society for the Boy Scouts of America. In high school, 
He purchased and completed the popular taxidermy correspondence course from the Northwestern School of Taxidermy. An avid bird watcher, Joe actually illustrated his own guide for the birds of Pennsylvania. To help procure specimens, Joe taught himself the art of trapping. By his senior year, he had earned enough money from collecting bounty on foxes to pay for all of his expenses to the senior prom. After graduation from high school, Joe enlisted in the Army, where he served in Germany with the military police and as a member of the 7th Army Pistol Team. On his way home from Germany in 1964, he stopped to visit the New York World's Fair, where he saw the life-size dinosaurs created by Lewis Paul Jonas and heard his name for the first time. He also visited the American Museum of Natural History, where he saw more work by Jonas, Akeley, Clark, and Rockwell. Enthralled by the artistry of the sculptor taxidermist to recreate the natural world, Joe applied and was accepted as a taxidermy apprentice at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. Joe learned taxidermy under the instruction of Harold Casey and Otto Epping. He co-apprenticed with Forrest Hart, where they learned to master excelsior wrapping methods and carving fish bodies from pine. After a year and a half on the job, Joe felt he had learned all that his superiors were likely to teach him. Frustrated with the limitations of quality forced upon him, Joe quit the museum and changed careers. He moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico to get out west and to be near his fiancée, Kathleen. He got married, raised a family, and became a patrolman for the Albuquerque Police Department. He continued his competitive pistol shooting, winning the state title in 1968, and he did it the hard way, left-handed. In 1970, Joe took a job at Jonas Brothers in Denver, Colorado, where he had the privilege of working alongside the last of the great old-time taxidermists there, and had the chance to meet with the great Louis Paul Jonas. In 1971, he went to Woodbury Taxidermy Studio in Wyoming, where he learned the ins and outs of sculpting mannequins. In 1974, Joe took a job at the Denver Museum of Natural History, working alongside Henry Witcher's Inchmug and other accomplished taxidermists. Joe wrote The Jonas Technique, Volumes 1 and 2, the first taxidermy instruction manuals to feature modern techniques with an emphasis on anatomical accuracy. After attending his first National Taxidermist Association convention in 1975, he started the Taxidermy Review Competition to promote taxidermy education and encourage national standards for the art. The taxidermy competition held at this convention was the first in the industry since 1883. These competitions provided the ideal opportunity for taxidermists to showcase their skills and establish themselves in industry employment. Among the very first winners of note were Bob Berry, Wendy Christensen, and Forrest Hart. In 1976, Joe bought Wide World of Taxidermy magazine, changed the name to Taxidermy Review, and edited and published it for nine years. From the first issue, Taxidermy Review had an editorial page. The main thrust was to champion the art of taxidermy and promote national standards and professionalism. Industry standards would have to be established in order for taxidermy to become truly professional. While briefly serving on the NTA Board of Directors in the early 1980s, Joe drafted the NTA competition scoring system, which is still used in its essentials today. Joe won Best of Show at the first NTA competition held in 1978. In 1982, Joe revolutionized the supply industry with a startup company called Rocky Mountain Taxidermist Co-op. The main concept was to invite sculptors to provide models to be manufactured and sold by the co-op and pay the artist 10% royalties. This had never been done before. The concept went over so well that several founding members soon withdrew from membership and opened their own supply companies. The largest suppliers also embraced this concept and began contracting with independent model makers to rapidly increase their product lines. 
The development of new taxidermy forms was threatened in the mid-80s by rampant copying of mannequins. After a five-year campaign against foreign piracy, in which Joe published editorials and demonstrated at trade shows how the bootleg forms would fit perfectly inside his molds, Joe joined forces with 11 other plaintiffs to successfully sue for copyright infringement. Dan Chase was ordered by the court to pay damages and to destroy all the pirated molds. With sculptors' rights upheld, the industry got back on track for producing new product lines. Joe has never been afraid to speak his mind, which at times has made him a controversial personality. But by presenting opposing or unpopular arguments, Joe has advanced the industry by exploring complex issues and helping people make up their own minds. Joe has sculpted hundreds of taxidermy forms for nearly a dozen supply companies, including Jonas Brothers, Van Dykes, McKenzie, Research, and Precision Mannequins. He continues to model mannequins and offers freelance services for taxidermy firms on large or difficult projects. As a result, to date, he has modeled and mounted seven life-size elephants, a half dozen elephant heads, four rhinoceroses, Brahma bulls, and giant alligators. He has also authored more than a hundred articles and has delivered seminars at dozens of taxidermy conventions around the world. Joe Kish's influence on our industry permeates all aspects of taxidermy, from publications to competitions, standards to copyrights. Joe has built the foundation of what modern taxidermy has become in the 21st century. Without Joe's influence, Perhaps none of us would even be here in Springfield right now. We are proud to pay tribute and award the fourth ever of the World Show's Lifetime Achievement Awards to Joe Kish of Texas. Please. I'm a, well, we'll tell you another little special thing in just a minute, but uh, we want to get Joe up here and, and let him say a few words. And uh, I'm going to get Russell to come over here. Joe, congratulations. It's been long deserved, and I'm just very proud to shake your hand and be a part of this. Thank you. I'm proud to shake yours, my friend. <laughs> Nick, you bring that award over. Actually, I'm gonna get if Russ and Joe would hold that. Watch the top. We forgot. We forgot to screw that down. Joe, you think you can handle and fix that? So, all right. I'm gonna get in this picture. He doesn't want to let go of it. <laughs> it's just something that's a, oh, oh yeah, well, okay, Russell, hold it. I want to get you to come over here. One other thing, our good friend, your good friend, Harry Paulson. Yes, yes, we're here. He called me a couple weeks ago. He's sitting right over there. And he has a complete set of taxidermy review that he is giving the, the world show to go to their auction tomorrow. And uh, there's no telling what somebody will pay for that. But I can tell you, I went back through all my old issues of tax term review to help Ken put together this program. And the articles, I couldn't quit reading them. I had all this world show to prepare for. They are as relevant today as they were back in the 70s and 80s when you did them. So thank you, buddy. Let you say a few words. I would like to ask us to take 10 seconds of silence 
for those taxidermists, friends of ours, who've passed on to a great reward, including but not limited to Simon Blackshaw, Henry Witchers, many others, and a particularly a particular relevance to those of us in Texas. We just lost Bob Williams a couple of weeks ago. So please, pause for 10 seconds. Thank you. And I would like to recognize a distinguished person in this audience who's not a stranger to any of us. And he was very instrumental in getting tax Taxidermy Review off the ground <clears throat> very early. <clears throat> and that's none other than the current, uh, the past winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award, Bob Berry. Please stand by. features of tax room and review was Bob Perry's fish painting articles. Well, that was a new idea. It's his idea. It fit in just exactly to what we wanted to do with the magazine and the needs of the industry. I promised Larry uh, I, I wouldn't be up here forever. I'll make this short. I'll give you four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, I'm not a stranger to recognition, but I've never had something quite like this in my industry. To make it brief, in 76, I pondered and pondered how to put together a taxidermy competition. Everybody I talked to in Denver, museum taxidermists, commercial taxidermists, people associated with the Denver Museum about holding a taxidermy competition, which I thought was a brilliant idea. It's kind of inspired by Charlie Haynes at the 75 Bucknell uh, NTA convention. Nobody would thought it was a good idea. And the big commercial houses didn't want to compete because they didn't want their competition to win and hold lord it over them. So I, I went ahead anyway and wrote all the rules, all the competition, uh, excuse me, all the criteria. I f uh, figured who I could get for judges and so forth, but I didn't have one person who said positively, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. So I continued to work on the criteria and I felt I had it all together. And I thought, now, what the heck am I going to do? I got no encouragement. And it occurred to me there's one person I could ask who would always get a straight answer, and who was forward looking. So at 1 o'clock in the morning, I called Forrest Hart up in Maine. Well, Forrest goes to bed at 9 o'clock. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. And he answered the phone, and I said, Forrest, I'm awfully sorry to call you this early, but I got something really important I want to ask you. And he, well, he said, it's okay. I had to get up to answer the phone anyway. <laughs> And I said, if I hold a tax revenue competition, would you come? He said, sure, sure I would. I said, are you all the way from Maine? You don't want it. Would you mean a competition? And I said, yeah. That's all I needed was just the backing and the confidence of one intelligent friend who was a tax revenue. Where are you, Forrest? Forrest was a trendsetter. Many of you out here, there he is over there. Many of you were trendsetters. Remember, of course, is the trend. My arms on the axe handle. You remember the bucklehead running across the fiberglass water? Those are two that come to mind. Numerous others. Sitting down bear. I told Forrest one time, he said, you think a bear, a black bear, could win in a competition? I said, no, you can't see any of the anatomy. So what did he do? He shows up the following year with a black bear sitting on his can, and he got a blue ribbon. He did it just to show it could be done, which I did. Anyway. I'm truly and genuinely moved to be up here and to be on it this way in front of my family, my beautiful daughter, my beautiful granddaughter, and my handsome son-in-law. And they have so many friends, associates, and colleagues here. And if it wasn't for an institution like Breakthrough Magazine, anything that I tried to do wouldn't have a vehicle to move forward. But what brought us to what we have here today in the tax revenue industry was the fact, and I'm most proud of this more than anything else, was I got to be the guy to open the door. But the first I'm almost done, Larry. At the first tax revenue review competition, I arranged with the Denver Museum 
for the whole and all the attendees to go through the taxidermy lab where Henry Wishes was working. That made the wedding between the commercial industry and the museum industry. It was a hit on both sides, the museum, the police, and I was able to introduce Henry back into mainstream of taxidermy. So anyway, thank you very much again. I wanted to bring about national standards in the industry. I couldn't do it alone. I created for it, and all of you did it. You just took the ball and ran with it, and I'm grateful. And I'm proud to be a member of this industry, because this is all I ever wanted to do in life, to be a tax person. Thank you.